Do you guys see that? Uh, are you seeing my slides? Yes, we can see Okay, it. okay. Oh, great. All right. Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, as Min Fang said, I'm a senior architect at HS Group. Uh, I've been working here for four years now. Uh, prior to that, I was a dev manager at uh, AWS. So I've, I've come from a reverse uh, career progression from manager to developer. Uh, but that's how it is. Um, so first, uh, for those who are not familiar with HGF5, let me briefly describe what it is. You can think of it as um, a CAPI, as well as a file format, as well as a data model. And you can think of it as a way of taking the common objects you would have uh, for a scientific application, and you can bundle them together. So in this picture, uh, you have this folder, which is the root group, and that can contain, let's say, a three-dimensional data array, a uh, raster image, you can have subgroups, uh, and subgroups could be a 2D array, a table, and so on. And, and furthermore, each of these objects can have its own set of metadata, which are like smaller pieces of data that describe uh, the data. Uh, for example, for an uh, uh, experiment, you may have a metadata that says what time uh, the data was collected. Uh, and it's useful because, you know, oftentimes in scientific uh, fields, uh, you collect a lot of data, but it's hard to keep it organized, right? You know, it gets separated in different files and you lose track of what relates to what. Uh, so with HF5, you can keep it all together. And it's a binary format that supports compression. So it's much more efficient, uh, say, than using CSV files uh, to store data. And HF5 has been around for 20 years now. So it's quite mature. Um, it's very popular uh, in US here with the Department of Energy, also NASA, and around the world it's used for lots of applications, primarily in simulation or scientific instrument data collection. We are spinning wheel, it's nice. Um, uh, kind of a challenge we have now is the growth of the amount of data. So this is a slide uh, from NASA presentation and showing uh, how the uh, collection of HFI data from satellites has grown from like half a petabyte in 2000 to uh, over 20 petabytes now. And it's only projected to grow more because there are more satellites and each of the satellites has more instruments and these instruments are collecting more data at a time. And traditionally, the way NASA has distributed this data is uh, have uh, data repositories where people can download files. And that was fine when the average file size was, say, 100 megabytes. But when you have files uh, that are multi-gigabytes and collections that are multi-terabytes, it becomes impractical for users to download all that data to their local system. So NASA is looking at storing data in the cloud. And one challenge uh, as regards to HDF5 is that HDF5 was designed before the cloud became a common platform. Uh, so there are various issues with using HDF5 in the cloud, primarily because HDF5 library requires a POSIX file system. So a few years ago, uh, we started a project uh, sponsored by NASA where we created a HDF data server, if you will. Okay, so this is HDF5 optimized for a cloud that uses uh, object storage, namely AWS S3, rather than POSIX file storage. And rather than a library, it's a service that runs as a cluster of Docker containers. By having uh, the system as a, a cluster of containers, you can scale out the service by having these containers running across multiple instances in the cloud. It's feature compatible with the H5 library and it's implemented in Python using async IO. So uh, features we have is that clients interact with servers using the REST API. So the REST API is fundamental uh, to how clients will engage with the service. But since you know, applications have been written previously that use either C API or different language APIs uh, like with Python, We've created SDKs that clients can use 
to keep using the same API they're using before, but now rather than talking to local files, they're talking over the web to the data server. Uh, given that the data is stored on S3, there's no limit to the amount of data you can store, and multiple clients can read write to the same data source at the same time, which is a limitation actually that HF5 library uh, has. Okay, that's to mention we can scale up uh, the service. And it's just, I'll talk later, we paralyze requests to the service to speed up performance. So here's how the client server uh, aspect works. You, on the red box, you have the data server. It's off somewhere uh, at known endpoint. You could have, say, a web application that's using Ajax to talk to the server. You could have a C4 application that's using HIV library. And the library invokes a plugin. So rather than talking to local files, it's going across the web talking to the server. And for Python, uh, we have a package called H5PyD, uh, which again talks to the, the REST API. So uh, how we designed this is actually a radical change uh, from how HFI works with POSIX. What we did is that we took the contents of HFI files, and uh, as you recall, there's, there's groups and there's data sets, and we shard those, right? We chop it up into smaller pieces, and you store each of those pieces as an object in S3. So if you imagine uh, this grid is an uh, array, we block it up into these, these uh, heavy outline regions we call chunks, and each chunk is stored as a separate object. Okay, when a client wants to read a particular region of this array, like uh, say the yellow region, the server will figure out which chunks are needed uh, to serve that data uh, and do the segmentation to deliver just the data the client needs. Uh, I mentioned the, the parallelism aspect. Uh, it's implemented actually a, a two-tier set of containers. There's this uh, front-end tier called service nodes. They handle requests from the clients. And there's a back-end tier that partitions the object source space. And when clients request uh, data that spans multiple objects, those requests can be paralyzed across any number of data nodes. So if you have 100 data nodes, and you're accessing data that spans 100 chunks, each of those data nodes can be reading data in parallel. And that speeds up performance greatly. Uh, I mentioned we use uh, Python with AsyncIO. AsyncIO is a, a rather new Python feature. Uh, and it's interesting that rather than using, let's say, multi-threading uh, to handle multiple tasks, use task switching. So for a data server, oftentimes uh, request is blocked waiting on some kind of data transfer. And the uh, async IO lets you block uh, that task when you're waiting for IO and, and switch over to some other task. So you get really good uh, CPU utilization using this technique. H5PyD uh, is a Python client. It's based on a, a popular Python package for regular HF5 called H5Py. So we took the same API and we just translate it so that, again, it talks to the server rather than talking to the library. Uh, there's actually some additions to H5Py features. Uh, for example, in uh, regular desktop usage, you just do ls to see what files you have. Uh, since the files in the HF server are now not mountable as a regular file system. We have uh, utilities to let you see what files are there. Uh, similarly, since you cannot uh, use regular POSIX chmod to assign permissions, there's a set of utilities to what's used called uh, access control list to control who can read or write or do other actions to the files. And there's also a uh, query interface. This lets you do like uh, SQL style commands to pull out just certain rows of a data set. Uh, there's the command line interface. Uh, again, it's a set of tools for like uploading data, downloading data, managing permissions, uh, and so on. 
Uh, in addition to that, we uh, recently launched uh, what's called Kita Lab. This is a hosted Jupyter Hub uh, environment. And what it does Okay, I hope you guys can still hear me. Hey, uh, okay, all right, sorry. Um, the, um, it enables you to connect to a social environment uh, so that uh, rather than connecting from your desktop, which may be very far away uh, from where the server is, you are running, um, a Jupyter, you're writing a Python environment within the same Amazon AWS region as the data server and as the S3 uh, storage objects. So you get very fast access. So say you're doing analytics over a very large data set, rather than moving the bulk of the data uh, from Amazon to your desktop, it's actually all happening within the Amazon data center. Right, so data is flowing from S3 storage through the data server to a container that runs your Jupyter environment. Okay. So this is how the architecture works. Uh, so here we have a user. Uh, it connects to this endpoint as Jupyter Hub. Once he signs in, Jupyter Hub spins up a new container that contains this environment. This environment has a disk volume that's attached to it. Uh, that's used as kind of like a scratch pad, um, kind of local POSIX disk. And the environment is configured to talk to the data server. So here we have our service node and data nodes, which is talking to S3. So you can uh, try this out right now if you want. Uh, the register at uh, hrgroup.org slash hfketalab. Um, and once you're registered, you sign in to hflab.hfgroup.org. So e each user gets the equivalent of a dedicated Xeon core with 8 gig of RAM, uh, a 10 gig of disk, and up to 100 gigabyte of cloud storage. So uh, we charge this minimal fee uh, to recoup our expenses of $10 a month but the first one's free, and uh, if you use a special ARDC Tech Talk uh, coupon code, you get two months free. Uh, here are some links uh, for more information uh, about everything I've talked about. And if I have a few minutes, I'd like to quickly demo um, how this works. Do that. So here. Let me um, sign out. Okay, so you come to hflab.hgroup.org and you sign in using your HF group registration. And once you're signed in, you have this environment. There is an FAQ. Um, you have a terminal. So I can do, so lists will show me like uh, content I have. Uh, HS info is one of the command line tools I mentioned. I can do say HS LS and see my home folder. So this is not a POSIX directory. This is a kind of a path managed by the server. So I'm seeing content that's stored uh, in S3 managed by the HDF server. Uh, if I do, I have a file here called tall.h5. There is an hdf5 library utility uh, called h5ls that you can show the contents of that file. And I have a tool hsload. We'll take that local file and upload it to the server. I can type. Okay, so now it's loaded and I can do HSLS again with this content.
And I see basically the same structure now it's replicated in the server. So what's the advantage of having this content managed by a server rather than managed just in this local disk I have at JupyterHub? Well, um, for one, you can share this content with other people. So traditionally with JupyterHub, it's very hard to share content among JupyterHub users. But here, anyone who's logged onto the system can see the content that I've uploaded. So this makes possible to have, say, uh, you know, shared folders of common data files, or have, uh, say, a uh, multiple processes that are all writing to the same file and aggregating data, and so on. Okay. Uh, we also have a collection of notebooks that can illustrate the usage. So let me clear all outputs. So if you're not familiar with uh, Jupyter Notebooks, it's kind of like MATLAB. You have content and cells, and you execute cells, and they do the function, and you can go back and change code and rerun it, and, and so on. So in this example, we took uh, 7,850 files that NASA published. And uh, these files represent, uh, I think it's one file per day of satellite data. And we munch those into one file served by the server. And so rather than a collection of 2D data slices, it becomes one 3D data cube. And it's much easier doing analytics to have this as a single data block rather than have to manage thousands of smaller files. Okay, so here I just, uh, I import these packages. Uh, so uh, here knows h5pyd is the Python package that's part of the hfkita SDK. And I open the file. And all this content looks just like it would with uh, accessing local files on disk except for using h5pyd rather than h5py. So let me see. So we can say the, sorry. Okay, so the shape of this is 7850. That's the ease that can basically the time dimension, right? There's one uh, extent for each file. And 720 and 1440 uh, map to longitude and latitude. So we can see the metadata for this. Uh, there's a fill value. Uh, here I'm extracting one piece of metadata called long name and displaying that. And now here I'm going to actually pull out data from the data set. So you can imagine maybe that this uh, entire uh, data set would be too large to fit to memory. And uh, what I'm going to do is says pull out one slice of it. And the Python syntax here is you have the data set uh, reference and say 1240 for the 1240th time slice. And the colon, 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 colon says pull in all the lat long of values. So I do that. And this took just 71 milliseconds. Uh, so in the 71 milliseconds, it's gone from the notebook running in Amazon to the data server, to S3, gotten data, fetched it back, and brought it back to my notebook. Uh, I'm actually cheating a bit because the server actually caches data that's recently been accessed. So let me change this to uh, a different slice, and it should be a little bit slower. Okay, so now it took uh, almost half a second to fetch the same data. But if we run it again, it, it's fast again. So S3 is, is not you know, that performant for accessing data. It's mainly used as a long-term archival storage. Uh, so in the Kita server, we keep a large RAM cache. So recently accessed data can be uh, fetched much faster than going to S3. Uh, so a nice thing about the notebook environment, it's easy to do plots, so I can plot this data and see it. I can zoom in on that. Uh, here I'm creating a histogram of the, the values. 
Okay. Now I mentioned that um, we don't store the entire data set as one object. We shard these objects. And this chunk layout describes the dimensions of each sharded object. So it's one by 720 by 1440. And why that's relevant is that if we do this kind of request, so now instead of accessing data that's aligned with the chunks, I'm accessing data that's orthogonal to the chunk layout. So in this request, we've had to access 500 chunks or 500 S3 objects. But because it's done in parallel on the server, it's actually fairly fast, right? So if you ran the same code on a workstation with local files, it may be slower than this to access. And again, I can do a plot. All right, um, so that's just a, a small uh, aspect. Uh, it's really a lot more uh, to it. Uh, but I encourage people to, again, uh, go on and uh, try, try out the Jupyter Hub and uh, if you're interested and have uh, things you need more information about, uh, please feel free to contact me. Okay, do you have any questions?